So Jesus in the sanctuary, part two. Well, part one, I kind of like laid the foundation. We didn't go deeply in the sanctuary as such, but we looked at a couple of things. And here's our key text during the series here. Exodus 25 verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God's desire was to dwell among his people. Sin had brought a deep rift and chasm. And God sought to bring about that reconciliation amongst his people. But it would all center in the plan of his salvation, which would take millennia. And so as we go through the Old Testament, we're going to see the links to the New Testament and how the sanctuary is really from Genesis to Revelation, literally from Genesis to Revelation. And so the aim is that God has given us the gospel in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Notice in Exodus 25 verse 40, and, just, and see to it, God told Moses, that you make them, that's the plan of the sanctuary, according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Remember, we looked at that when God delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. It was to the Passover that the 10th plague would bring about death and destruction to the ungodly and bring about life and deliverance to the godly, to those who are obedient, as Chantel prayed. Lord, help us to be obedient to your voice and to follow you. Well, they had to follow the cloud because God was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And of course, Egypt is a symbol of spiritual apostasy, of rebellion, of defiance, of atheism. And so God takes them out of that country, uh, out of that people, and they go through the Red Sea, a symbol of baptism. They went and followed that cloud and they were baptized, Paul says, into the Corinthian church through the Red Sea. And then God takes him to Mount Horeb, or Mount Horeb, the holy habitation. And there Moses is called up to receive the sanctuary message, the sanctuary plan. And, and, and it would center on the entire plan of salvation. The sanctuary, if we don't understand the sanctuary message, we don't really understand the deep love of God and his plan to save us from sin and to eradicate sin. It's all in the sanctuary. As we look at Mount Horeb, uh, as God called Moses up, uh, first of all, he was to make a sacrifice before he went up the mountain. Um, and that is an altar. There was a burning bush that God appeared to him. So there was a bright light there. And of course, when they went up in the mountain, they ate and drank. So there is some food, showbread. And here is the foundation here. As they go up to receive, as Moses goes up to receive the Ten Commandments, they were written on tables of stone, sapphire, God's throne, had come down on top of the mountain and the mountain was on fire and there was thunder and there was lightning and uh, there was an earthquake. We're going to see some of these same manifestations in the book of Revelation. Uh, I can tell you as we study the sanctuary here, the book of Daniel, and so picture the children of Israel. Uh, they were encamped at the bottom of the table. Uh, sorry. They were encamped at the bottom of, at the, bottom of the mountain and, and God had told them uh, through Moses to make a sanctuary. Well, we looked at last week the seven colors of the sanctuary. And, and we discovered that as we looked at the seven colors of the sanctuary, we see that it begins with blue. Blue is symbolic of God's law. Blue is sapphire. And God had come down on the mountain and we discovered from the book of Ezekiel, uh, and also in the book of Jeremiah, we see that God's throne is on sapphire. And we find that the other color in the sanctuary is, after the blue, is red. We're going to look at that this, this evening. 
and, and much deeper next week. And of course, red is symbolic of blood. Blood had to be shed for the broken law of God so that we could be made white in the righteousness of Christ. We looked at the sanctuary itself and the fact that it had fine linen around it, around it to mark off the border, and inside of it was the courtyard and outside of it was the camp. And we discovered that Jesus had to come down when he was born of a woman. We looked at Galatians 4 verse 4. And we also looked at John 1 verse 14 that um, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt in the Greek is tabernacle. And so Christ came into the camp to become one with us and one like us. So that when he moved into the court through the gate, which is symbolic of him, that he would die for the sins of the world at the altar of sacrifice in the court. So, so Christ accomplishes that, of course, in the earth, on the earth, when he came the first time. So, so if you look at the rest of the colors, we find that when you mix blue and purple together, after the blood of Christ has atoned for our breaking of God's law, which is blue, you mix those two colors together, you get the color purple. And we're going to see the color purple was at the front covering. It was at the first veil that went into the actual tabernacle. It was also on the second. The colors blue, red, and purple are on all three curtains. As you enter first into the courtyard, as you enter in through the first veil or curtain into the holy place, as you enter through the second veil into the most holy place, those colors are replete with examples of how God seeks to save us. And so we see purple, of course, is the color of royalty. Jesus uh, was put on a purple robe because they said they mocked him. Hail the king of the Jews. And James 2 verse 8 tells us, don't you know that God's law is a royal law? And so when God saves us from transgression, sin, 1 John chapter 3 verse 4, that's the definition of sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. We are sinners and God wants to save us. And the sanctuary is all about his plan of salvation. And then, of course, brass has to do with that which is earthly. Gold has to do with that which is heavenly. And we're going to look at that in the tabernacle proper. Silver, which was on the uh, also in the tabernacle and around the, the posts, the sockets of the posts that were brass were silver. Um, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. So as we look at the sanctuary, uh, as I've entitled this study tonight, it's all about Jesus, the Messiah. And we're looking at part two. I asked the question in our last study, why did God give us the sanctuary? Well, the book of Hebrews, Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter four, that the, the gospel, the sanctuary, the gospel was preached to them. That pronoun is the children of Israel in the wilderness. So the gospel was preached to them as well as to us. A lot of people think this is also about the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And the gospel, of course, is God's giving to you and I the gift of salvation. And in the Old Testament, it was through the sacrificial systems, of course, that pointed to Jesus Christ. So it was a compacted gospel that was demonstrated by God of how he would save his people from the penalty of sin. So we looked at this text uh, in our study last week, Exodus 27 verse 9. You shall also make the court of the tabernacle. So as, as you went into the court of the tabernacle, um, it had hangings on the south and on the north. And of course, it also had hangings on the eastern side with a door to come through. And then on the west, it was closed off. The sanctuary was always facing west, facing west. So you had to turn your back on the east. And God did that on purpose because the heathens, particularly in Egypt, they worshipped Amun-Ra, image of the sun. At the rising of the sun, they would worship the sun god, S-U-N. And God was trying to turn people to worship the son of God, S-O-N. And so he made the sanctuary westward so that as you came to the sanctuary, you had your back to the east. And uh, this was quite something God thought about all this. 
before he gave Moses the plan. And then he says in Exodus 27 verse 16, For the gate of the court, there shall be a screen 20 cubits long. A cubit is about 44 centimeters. And this screen, which was a door, um, it had three entrances into it. Uh, think about this as an invitation from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for people to come in and find salvation through Christ because the sanctuary is all about Jesus. And so you see there uh, that the screen had to be, of course, it was in linen, which is white, but it was woven with blue, purple, and scarlet. Blue, the sapphire color of the law, scarlet, the, bl the blood shed for redemption or pardon from sin, which is transgression of the law. And when God has saved us through his blood, we are now the sons of God, purple, the color of royalty. Amazing, fascinating. And um, it shall have four pillars of sockets, right? So as we look at the sanctuary itself, uh, it is clearly God's plan in how he would save Israel. And of course, it pointed forward to the coming of the Messiah. For you and I today, we look back. The Messiah has come and he has fulfilled all that the sanctuary taught of in the Old Testament. Now, for you and I to understand the book of Daniel and the end time prophetic book of Revelation, if we don't understand the Old Testament and particularly the sanctuary, its doctrine and what it taught, its symbols, then we will be really lost and we'll be giving our own type of interpretation. And um, the Bible says we must allow God's word to interpret it, interpret itself. So let's not give our own interpretation. So as you look at the entrance to the courtyard, before you got to the tabernacle, you got to the courtyard. And uh, the whole structure, that is the courtyard and the tabernacle, which is the building in the center of the courtyard, of course, is called the sanctuary. And the building, the holy place and the most holy place, is called the tabernacle. So here is Psalm 102 verse 19. This is speaking of God now. For he looked down from the heights of his sanctuary. This is God looking down from the sanctuary. Here we're going to discover that there is the true sanctuary, the one that God built in heaven. And the plan that God gave to Moses was a copy, a pattern uh, of what the sanctuary in heaven was like and what it taught. So God looks down from the height of his sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary, from the heaven, the Lord viewed the earth. And so here's our next key text that we'll be looking at quite regularly through this series. Psalm 77 verse 13. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Uh, Mig Migdash is the word there for sanctuary. That means sanctified, separated for a holy use. And so that included the entire sanctuary, the courtyard, and of course the building, which was a tabernacle. And here John says in John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So God's way is in the sanctuary. And of course that way is in Christ. Uh, so this, this entire series you'll discover is going to be so full of Christ and we will see the joy of the gospel in the Old Testament, how it foretold what Jesus would do in the New Testament and how it points to the work he will finish in the heavenly sanctuary after he had paid the sacrifice for the sins of the world on the cross. Well, Jesus says in John 10 verse 7 to them, that's the scribes and the Pharisees who had not accepted him as the Messiah. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So Jesus, twice in John 7, uh, 10 verse 7, he's the door of the sheep. In John 10 verses 9, again, he says to them, I am the door of the sheep. And uh, only those who will come in through me will go out and find pasture. And then in John 10 verses 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. So, so as we look at in the book of Hebrews, we see very clearly uh, how Jesus fulfills all the functions of the high priest in the earthly sanctuary, in the wilderness sanctuary, 
and also in the temple later on in Jerusalem when Israel was established as a nation there. And also we see that it pointed so clearly to the work that Jesus would do as our high priest. So we're going to study in particularly the dress of the high priest and the function of the high priest and how he was a mediator between the people and between God. And notice what it says here of Jesus now in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now you can understand why there was blood on the entrance to the courtyard of the sanctuary. Because we can only enter through the blood of Christ. We can only receive forgiveness from breaking the law of God. Blue, sapphire law of God. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so as a result of salvation in Christ, we become covered with his righteousness. The fine linen, which was around the actual sanctuary. And then we become the sons and daughters of God. Notice what it says here in Hebrews 10 verse 20. So we enter into the sanctuary through Christ in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It says here, by a new and living way, which he, Jesus, had consecrated for us through the veil. And now it tells you what the veil is. That is to say, he is flesh. So clearly here, Paul, who I believe is the writer of the book of Hebrews, is telling us that just as one had to enter into the court through the veil to receive Forgiveness for sin at the altar of sacrifice. Jesus is that door. And then, of course, there was another veil into the holy place. And after Jesus sacrificed for our sins, he entered into the heavenly sanctuary through that veil. That is to say his flesh. So, and, and as we look at entering into the most holy place, and of course, Daniel gave the prophecy about that. Daniel 8.14. Again, we can only enter the veil to the flesh of Jesus Christ because he is the way into the sanctuary. Again, Exodus 25 verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God wanted to dwell among his people and God wanted his people to dwell with him. And so the sanctuary taught salvation through God's provision, his plan. So the Hebrew word for sanctuary is Mikdash, like I said, set apart, sanctified. It means hallowed. It means for a special purpose. And so the sanctuary was consecrated and dedicated to showing and revealing the children of Israel and the nations around them because they were to be a light to the Gentiles, how they would find forgiveness for sin and to become part of God's people. And so the sanctuary was set apart for that special purpose. Uh, the, the word tabernacle, that is specifically referring to the walls of the, the building within the sanctuary. Of course, it also was part of the sanctuary. But when the Bible speaks of the tabernacle specifically, it's talking about the tent. And, and notice what it says here in Exodus 25 verse 9. Moses was told, told to make it according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle. And so in the tabernacle itself was where God would meet specifically um, with the priest and on the day of atonement with the high priest above the Ark of the Covenant where there was a mercy seat above the law of God, sapphire stone, tap, two tablets of stone. And above the mercy seat were two cherubims looking down with reverence onto the holy law of God. And between the cherubim, there was a bright light that shone. The Bible speaks of it. We will look at it when we study the Ark of the Covenant. It was called the Shekinah. The, it was the glory of the presence of God. And there God would meet as the one who would bring cleansing through the mediation of the high priest. And so God can only reconcile us through our high priest, Jesus Christ, in the heavenly sanctuary. And so the earthly was a type. Type means a symbol. It means a figurative explanation of the reality. So notice what it says here. Moses told, and also the pattern of all its furnishings. So we're going to study all the furnishings in the courtyard. We're going to study that in proper next week. 
as we begin the courtyard, and then we're going to move from the courtyard into the holy place. There was three main articles of furniture in the holy place, and then we're going to move into the most holy place, three articles in one article, sorry, in the most holy place, uh, but actually three inside the Ark of the Covenant, uh, God's holy commandments, the Ten Commandments, the law of God, and of course we've got uh, the pot of manna and uh, the the rod of Aaron that budded, but that we will study in a later uh, a study. So notice what it says here in Exodus 25, verse 40. Again, Moses said, see to it at the end of that chapter that you make them, that's all the furnishings, all the utensils, the courtyard, uh, its borders, the tabernacle, the building, and everything in it. See that you make them according to the pattern which was shown to you in the mount. So as we look at, as we enter through the door, or the gate of the courtyard, the first thing we see here is the brazen altar of sacrifice. So it was made of brass. Brass, brass represents the earth. So it has to do with the functions that Jesus came to do whilst he was on earth when he came the first time as the Messiah. And so as we look at the instruments in the courtyard, the posts of the boundary was all made of brass. The tabernacle itself, we'll see all gold. But the court and the two articles of furniture, which is the altar of sacrifice made out of brass, and then the laver, which was a big basin or receptacle, um, that held water and to do with washing that was also made of brass and so it's very important to understand well why was the tabernacle made of gold remember gold gold is heavenly uh we'll look at a few texts but it, it had curtains over it and the curtains had colors specific colors of red you can see uh the main color blood symbolic of blood without blood the priests could not enter daily into the holy place and without blood, the high priest could not enter once a year into the most holy place. So the tabernacle and its services had blood, which represented, of course, the blood of Christ. And then, of course, the posts were all overlaid with gold. Inside of it, in the holy place, it was pure gold. The boards were, were made out of acacia wood or shittim wood, but they were overlaid with gold. Uh, the seven branch candlestick, gold. The table of showbread, gold. The, the posts and pillars inside, gold. The altar of incense, gold. And so think about this as the light that was emanating from the seven branch candlestick lit up this entire uh, room. Uh, the colors of the curtains of the veil coming in and out blue, red, purple, and also the ceiling, this would now reflect against the golden walls and it would be like a rainbow. Uh, and, and, and green is the dominant color there, emerald. And, and so we, we come into the tabernacle before the throne of God. And we see in the book of Revelation, this is what it says here, what the throne of God in heaven is. And there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. So it was reflecting off this gold, uh, glittering so brilliantly that when those colors through the candlelight uh, came through, it was like emerald. And so here is Revelation 21 verse 11. And the building, this is speaking of the temple in heaven now, and the building and the city as well. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was of pure gold like unto clear glass transparent. So you think about the reflection um, of the colors of the rainbow as a result of the light. So as we look at the, the layout, the schematic diagram before you there, you see the gate as the sinner would come in through the gate. The colors would remind him of God's law the blood shed for the forgiveness of sin, which is the broken law of God, the white, the righteousness of God. And of course, we see the purple one would become royalty. 
And, and this is really what it looked like. You can see here, um, I've got um, the compass there. So the tabernacle was always west. And so you had to go to the tabernacle facing west. And so as you came to the gate, your back was to the east. And then the first thing you saw was the brazen altar in the outer court, of course. Um, and then you had the laver made out of brass with water. And then, of course, you had a veil here to enter the holy place where you got the table of showbread. You got the candle, seven branch candlestick, the altar of incense. We're going to study all these in particular, how these um, are symbolic of the work of Christ after he had paid the price for the sins of the world. What he accomplished as the penalty, the redemption to the penalty of your and my sins, he continued to appropriate in the heavenly sanctuary. And so seven branch candlestick, table of showbread, altar of incense. And I'm going to see you, I'm going to show you at the end of the study how in the book of Revelation we find these articles of furniture and Jesus ministering in the heavenly sanctuary after the cross. And, and this is just so, so clearly taught in the Bible. As we look at the court, not the court, sorry, but the camp of the children of Israel, this is basically how, how it looked like. So you had on the north, you had three tribes. On the east, you had the three tribes, beginning with Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. On the south, you had Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And then in the west, you had Ephraim, Manasseh, and uh, Benjamin. Uh, and then, of course, in the center of the camp, you had the sanctuary, and in there, of course, the tabernacle. But around it, of course, you had the Levites with the different groups of people that were responsible for the services. There was quite a lot in setting up the sanctuary, quite a lot in taking it down, and, of course, in the ministering of the sanctuary. So I thought I'll just show you that, and you can see um, the tabernacle was westward. So as one came, uh, they saw, first of all, as they approached the sanctuary they saw it surrounded by the white curtain symbolic of christ's righteousness we looked at that as they came in through the gate uh it was symbolic of christ's flesh when he was to give himself for the sins of the world but of course in the old testament they came with a lamb that lamb was symbolic of christ and as a sinner they would come to the altar of sacrifice we're going to look at that deeply next week and then of course the priest would minister for them in the courtyard and then take the blood of the sacrifice into the holy place and then once a year in the most holy place. The whole fence was had posts of brass in sockets of silver and these were connected by brass rings. We, we, we see that this is all symbolic of Christ. It took me a while to make this slide here, but this is really Jesus in the sanctuary. Um, and I thought this was just brilliant to be able to illustrate it like this here. So the sanctuary itself was in the form of a cross. You came in from the east facing west and you had the altar of burnt offering. And from there, there was in the courtyard. And then you had the laver. So Christ was crucified for your and my sins on the cross, which is the altar of burnt offering. And of course, the offering had to be holy consumed on there. Its blood was taken into the holy place. But before that, the priest had to wash at the laver. And you can see the laver is around the loins because something very important here. As Christ hung on the cross, he was paying the penalty for the broken law of God. And so his head is on the, the Ark of the Covenant is there, the most holy place. On his heart, he's got the altar of incense. It's all about prayer. And then on either hand, he has the table of showbread. We're going to look at what that means. And on the other hand, the golden candlestick. And this is just incredibly beautiful to see how it all illustrates Christ's earthly ministry in the courtyard and Christ's heavenly ministry in the, of course, tabernacle itself. And we're going to look at that. But, but, but don't you love the fact that Above the law was the mercy seat, uh, the gospel of God. God wants to show mercy for his broken law. And God wants you and I to understand. He has made a way for you and I through the Holy Spirit 
and the work of the Holy Spirit, the candlestick, so that we can be obedient to God's law and live happy, holy, and healthy lives. And here is just an amazing outlay of what it looks like. Here's a different schematic diagram here. You can see the sinner came to the foot of the cross. That was the altar of burnt offering. And then to the labor, labor through the priest. He had to wash them before he could go and minister into the holy place. And of course, there was a curtain into the holy place. Three articles of furniture, like I said. And then there was a curtain once a year into the most holy place because the sins of the people who came, of Israel, who came to the court and brought the sacrifice was symbolic of transfer of sin from the sinner to the sacrifice. And through the blood, the record of sin was transferred into the holy place. And then once a year, the entire sanctuary, through the ministration of the most holy place service, Day of Atonement, would cleanse all the sins. We're going to understand it very, very, very clearly. So, uh, as your heart beat for the love of God and others, as you look at this year, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you trust God to supply all your temple and spiritual needs? That's the altar of showbread. Uh, sorry, the table of showbread. And, and here is something here. Are you and my passions under the control of the new birth, which is baptism? Um, and you can see clearly the labor is by the loins. So Christ was in total surrender to God's will so that he fully obeyed God's will. And all his passions were under check. And because Christ had paid the supreme sacrifice for you and my sins, he was able to give to you and I a new way into the holy place and then the most holy place. We will look at this in particular. So here is Hebrews 9 verse 23. It says, therefore, now when the Bible says, therefore, you need to ask yourself, what is it therefore? The, the chapter of Hebrews is talking about the earthly sanctuary. And it's talking about the priests and their services. If you read from verses 1 through to 23, it's telling you about the, the, the sacrifices that were given and what the priests would do for the people. And then at the end, in the conclusion of the chapter, Paul says, therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. In other words, the earthly sanctuary was a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. It goes on to say, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices. And so the sacrifices on the earthly sanctuary was lambs and rams and bulls and goats. This was the symbols that were used to point to the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But when he died, because Paul's writing after Jesus had died and resurrected and gone to heaven, into the heavenly sanctuary. He says, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. In other words, nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice what it says here in verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. No, no. The ones made with hands is the sanctuary on earth that God said to Moses, see that you make it exactly according to the pattern. But the heavenly sanctuary is not made with hands. Not earthly. It's made by God himself. For Christ has not entered the holy places. So in the heavenly sanctuary, you've got a holy place and you've got a most holy place. And Christ has entered both for you and me after he paid the sacrifice for the sin of the world. And then it goes on to say here, I'll read it again. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are of the true. So clearly the one on earth, Moses' sanctuary in the wilderness was a copy, a shadow of the true. The temple later on built by Solomon in Jerusalem was a copy, was a shadow of the true one. It says here, but into heaven itself. So the true sanctuary is in heaven where God is dealing with the sin issue, where God is presenting uh, himself as the sacrifice for the sins through his son, Jesus Christ, and where God is dealing with the judgment. We have studied in Daniel, but we'll see it very clearly taught in the sanctuary service in a later study. And, and it says here, now to appear in the presence of God for who? For us. Isn't that good news? Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary, appearing in the presence of God for us. So John, who writes the book of Revelation, gives us what happened in the heavenly sanctuary. Well, Daniel writes of the sanctuary. Now, we study in the book of Daniel. Remember Daniel 8, verses 14? 
Here's, here's the text. For unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, remember, Daniel is writing when there was no sanctuary. Jerusalem had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was a captive in Babylon. And the temple was completely destroyed and burned to the ground. So there was no temple in Jerusalem. So Daniel was not writing about the heavenly temple. The, uh, sorry, the earthly temple in Jerusalem. He clearly was writing about the heavenly temple because the book of Daniel we saw, particularly the 2300 days or the 2300 year prophecy, had to do with the time of the end. And the time of the end we studied in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11 in specific, had to do after 1798. Well, when John now is writing of the heavenly sanctuary, there is no sanction on earth again. Because although the sanctuary had been rebuilt after the children of Israel had been released from Babylonian captivity by Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, it was rebuilt by Ezra, Nehemiah, and later on, of course, Herod did a lot by the time of Christ, by the time Christ came to this earth. Of course, there was the sanctuary, the temple in Jerusalem. But that too was destroyed by the Romans in the year A.D. 70. So the first one, while Daniel was writing, destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. The second one that was rebuilt was destroyed in A.D. 70 by the Romans. So clearly, Daniel couldn't have been writing about the earthly sanctuary. And of course, it could only be about the heavenly sanctuary. And, and here is what the book of Hebrews goes on to say. Now listen to this here. It says in Hebrews 8 verses 1. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. If you study the book of Hebrews and you don't understand it, well, carry on and ask the Holy Spirit to give you enlightenment. Uh, Paul is saying, this is the main point of the things we are saying. And notice what is the main point. We have such a high priest. Hallelujah. Who is this high priest? He goes on to say, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Wait. In the heavens, here is this high priest. It is none other than Jesus Christ, our high priest. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. It goes on to say here, a minister of the sanctuary and of what? The true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So clearly again, the tabernacle that was erected by Moses was erected by man. The temple in Jerusalem, later on built by Solomon, erected by men. But the tabernacle, the temple, the sanctuary in heaven was erected by God. And it is the center. It is the throne room. It is the center of our salvation. It is the hot spot. You can say it is the place where the whole of the universe is looking in to how God is going to save mankind. First of all, to the ministry of Jesus Christ the first time when he came to the court and then to the camp on the cross, uh, came to the camp and then to the court on the cross. And then, of course, as he ascended into heaven to minister for us, the minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle. So it's the hot spot. The sanctuary in heaven is the hot spot. It is the command center. It is where the throne room of God is based and where Jesus is interceding for us as our high priest. Notice here, Hebrews 8 verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Now, he's talking about on, on the earthly sanctuary, right? The high priest. And by the way, if a high priest died, he was replaced by another high priest. Well, well, Jesus became a high priest once for all. And so these high priests on the earthly sanctuary, they were appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Now, what about our heavenly priest, high priest. Therefore, it is necessary in the same verse that this one, speaking of Christ, Jesus, also have something to offer. And so as we look at Christ offering himself for us, the book of Revelation tells us this year, Revelation 1 verse 5, you will not understand clearly the book of Revelation if you do not understand the sanctuary services in the Old Testament. And of course, in the book of Daniel, Revelation 1 verse 5, to him, this is Jesus Christ who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So on the cross, Jesus died for you and my sins. As he enters into heaven, 
to minister for us in the heavenly sanctuary. He's ministering for us with his blood that he shed once. The high priest had to shed sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. But Jesus, once for all, we will study that in particular. Revelation 1 verse 13, after he has, after it shows that Jesus shed his blood for our sins in Revelation chapter 1, we see him going into now the holy place. Notice here in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, in the midst of the seven lampstands. Now, where was the seven lampstand? It was found in the holy place. One like the Son of Man. Who is that? Jesus Christ. Again, Daniel speaks of him as the Son of Man coming uh, with the clouds, clouds of angels. And it says here, he was clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. We're going to look at the, the dress of the priest and particularly the high priest. They had... Uh, 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 they were girded. They had a, a priestly gown in white. And they had this band to tie it together. And the high priest had the ephod. Um, it was a breastplate. And it had 12 stones. And then he had two uh, stones also on his left and right shoulder. We'll look at all that. But there's a picture of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, but he's dressed like a priest. Why? He is walking amongst the seven candlesticks, the seven branched candlestick in the heavenly sanctuary. And we see something else here in Revelation 8 verse 3. Then another angel, we're going deeper into the heavenly sanctuary now in the book of Revelation. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. This is the altar of incense. So this altar of incense we find, of course, in the heavenly sanctuary too. Because the earthly was a copy. It was a pattern. And then we, we, we see that there was also the table of showbread. And then at the end, in Revelation 11, right through to the end of the book, until God is with his people again in heaven, from chapter 21 through to uh, chapter 20 through to 22, we find then the temple of God was opened. Where, everyone? The Bible says clearly in heaven. There is a temple. There is a sanctuary. The true tabernacle that God erected. And it was the place where God's throne would be and where the salvation of man would be centered in the work and ministry of Jesus Christ. Notice what John sees. Now, now when it says here, then the temple of God was opened in heaven. You know, in other places, God, uh, John says, I saw, I saw in heaven. But here, now, when he says, I saw, that would be, that would mean what? Plural, singular. But here he says, then the temple of God was opened in heaven. In other words, this was for everybody to see. It was opened in heaven. And of course it says, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And we discovered that there are angels coming in and out of that most holy place just before the judgment is finished and Jesus comes. And so we see it is a, a, a complete total Wonderful manifestation of the ministry of Jesus Christ, our high priest. There for you and me in the most holy place. And preparing a place for you and I to be saved in his kingdom. And so the earthly, again, was a shadow. Now, a shadow, of course, would always be something that is a copy of the original. So if you hold up your finger against the light like I'm doing now, I can see the shadow of my finger on this table. Now, my finger is, of course, the original image. And, of course, the shadow now <clears throat> is a copy cast down. So here is something that I need you to understand. The sanctuary on earth were, was a shadow. And we're going to look at the seven feasts and how they were a shadow of what God would come. The sacrifices were a shadow so that when Jesus came, the true the Lamb of God was sacrificed. That's why the curtain in the temple in Matthew 27 verse 51 was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And if it's torn from the top, it means it's a divine hand that tore it, signifying that the earthly temple services had come to an end. So the curtain was torn in two. When we study the veils, the curtains, and what they mean as we go in the tabernacle, you'll understand it more clearly. Well, John says this in John 1 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So all the sacrifices in the courtyard was symbolic of the true sacrifice that Jesus would make with his personal 
blood, with his life and his shed blood. Hebrews 9.22, without shedding of blood, there's no remission. We would find no forgiveness of sin. If Jesus had not paid the price for the sins of the world, then everyone who had died in the Old Testament under the sacrificial systems that had been offered for sin would not find salvation. Had Christ come down from the cross and not died for the sins of the world, no one would be saved. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels in the um, tabernacle because of the work that he pointed forward to. The daily was, of course, what the children of Israel would find, forgiveness of sin through the daily sacrifices, and of course, corporately for the children of Israel, and then yearly, once a year. And it all pointed to what Jesus would do. And so we're going to look at the altar of sacrifice and study that solely next week. We're going to unpack the deep meanings of what took place and how it points to the work that Jesus would accomplish when he came the first time as the Messiah to die for the sins of the world. It's going to be so beautiful. I hope you enjoyed the study with me this evening. Let's close for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have sent your son Jesus the first time to fulfill all the promises in the Old Testament, the sanctuary that pointed to what Christ would do to save us from our sins and how through his death in the courtyard, on the cross, on the altar of sacrifice, he could apply the benefits of his shed blood and his broken body for us in the heavenly sanctuary so that tonight as we pray to you, we have a high priest who's representing us before you. Bless each one tonight and who will study deeper into this. I pray in your precious name. Amen.